Okay. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to have to shout today. Apparently, the sound system doesn't work. So I take it you can all hear me. Is that correct? All right. Yeah. has to be like Shabbos and Shul or something like that. Right? Uh, without the harangue. The, uh, first of all, uh, you'll excuse me for sitting down by bad knees last time I stood up and then I paid for it. So as long as I'm able to, um, even though temperamentally I'd rather stand, I always forget how it works in college. If you're in the sciences, I think you sit in the humanities, you stand or the other way around. I think, or maybe the humanities, you sit in the sciences, you stand. Remember that? But uh, that went out with straw hats after uh, Labor Day and so forth. I mean, before Labor Day. Uh, as we know, tonight is the second of the series that we're doing the three weeks this summer, uh, which is called Dancing on Eggs While Holding Back the, uh, Trying to Hold Back the Storm, about the court Jews in Spain. This is what we're doing now for the three weeks. Tonight is election number two. As we shall see, although I'm going to begin by finishing off lecture number one since it's so long. Some of these guys are like, you know, really very interesting lives. It's hard to leave the, the important parts out. And uh, tonight, as you know, is being sponsored, as you can see, by the Berlins. Uh, in memory, actually, look, at the, look what it says on the screen. Sherry had an uncle who, who, who gave his life fighting for Israel in 48. Okay? So we all know what that means. Uh, did he have any children or anything like that? He was 17. Oh my goodness, he was 17 years old when he was, when he when he fell in battle fighting for Israel. Oh, so he was, uh, he, the, the, and he survived, survived the war. Whoa! <laughs> so this this is literally the least we can do to pay tribute to his memory. I do want to thank, as you see, you know Howard and Paul over here. Some of the tech team people can't be here tonight, and uh, they're 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 pulling their weight and and double their weight. So I think everybody should give them a round of applause. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. And now we'll jump right into it. Last time I spoke at great length about Chazdev and Shabrut because there's a lot to talk about. And I didn't cover everything, but I didn't want to be there all evening. And I'm going to finish up two parts that are very important, and then I'll proceed to the second, to the second subject. So tonight we continue the story we started last week about Chazdev and Shabrut and his adventures. But this time... Not in such a nice vein. The rich and powerful can be capricious and sometimes despotic. As we saw last week, Chazdai had a close relationship with a Hebrew teacher, Menachem ben Saruk. Okay? Uh, but it was a hierarchical one. He's the patron, he's the employee. There's no question about that. Chazdai is rich and powerful and famous and all that. Deservedly so. And the other guy is, you know... I, I won't say the Hebrew teacher because he's much greater than just that. He was a, one of the founders of Hebrew grammar and so forth, and he wrote the first Hebrew dictionary, uh, which Rashi uses copiously. But nevertheless, he's rich, he's poor. That's the bottom line. And moreover, uh, the, the poor guy kind of like was patronized by the family. Menachem, and this happens sometimes in art, when you have these famous people, but they have patrons. And so a lot of times, they'll do a famous painting of the guy's daughter or grandchildren at the third birthday party. You know what I mean? Why'd they do that? I'll let you figure that one out. <laughs> now, the, uh, so he used to write little poems and, you know, when they had anniversaries and so on and so forth. But then something happened, and the patron turned on the scholar like a viper. Being rich and powerful, because they could do that. He was the top Jew under the Caliph Abdurman, as we saw. Deservedly so. Well, that means he's in charge of all the Jews. Just like the Caliph can do whatever he wants to anybody, so this guy can do it to the Jews. We don't know exactly what turned him off, but something happened to turn him off. I told you last week there's a famous theory that the guy who wanted his job did Lush and Har on him. Very possible. That would be Dunash Ben Lebrat. If that's the case, you have to think twice when you say, because he wrote that. Or maybe you don't want to sing, it's all from Dunash, you see? If it's true that he mean, now he did mean mouth, but if, if that's what caused it. But re, being rich and powerful, therefore, Chazdim and Chaprud had, like the, salt, like the caliph, he had his goon squads. He had his goon squads. 
And so they went to the humble home of the Hebrew grammarian Menachem in Cordoba on a Saturday morning. They literally tore the house apart. They beat up Menachem and his family, and they physically kicked them out of town, leaving them penniless and exposed to misery and starvation, all because Chazdei had somehow started to dislike him. I'll say it again. It happened on a Shabbos morning. Now you're asking me a question. How can you do this? That's why history is so interesting. It happens. <laughs> okay? It happens. The poor Hebraist wrote a long poem, which I hope to do in the podcast, basically asking, what did I do to provoke this? It's a long poem where he says, I was sitting here minding my business. You and I had a good relationship. I did this favor for you and that favor. And all of a sudden, you sent in the goon squads on a Shabbos morning and so forth. Chazdai arrogantly replied, and here you have the arrogant smugness of the richy rich. If you have really sinned, then I brought you to Musar, to uh, retribution, chastisement. And if you did sin, then you get Chayol Mahavah. You know what I mean? So you see the dark side of these rich and powerful guys. Now, again, this is history. History, you deal with people as they are. You can't say somebody's good. You can't say somebody's bad. George Washington had his good side. He had his bad side. I mean it. Thomas Jefferson had a good side and a bad side. Chazdi did a lot of good things. And we saw that last time. And you cannot deny that. However, he also had this <clears throat> side, OK? I would go so far as to say he picked, he picked the wrong guy to beat up because he left in this poem an immortal monument to his nastiness. You understand? Uh, and even says, God will punish you. Go to the next one. The small house that I inherited from my fathers. You destroyed it on Shabbos, on a young Moed. And a bunch of Goyim, so he had a goon squad of Arabs. And they profaned it. This chotzer, this courtyard, this small house, which you gave commands to destroy, this is what all our father left us, me and my uh, uh, siblings who are yisomim, who are orphans. What does the Bible say happens if you mess with orphans? God will take up my cause. Now, like I said before, he picked the wrong guy in the sense that, you know, writers can write, you see? But we don't know what happened afterwards, and it's a bummer, okay? It does not reflect well on Chazdai. However, from the point of view of Dikduk, okay, this episode launched a remarkable progressive development because everybody got into the Menachem Dunash fights. Now, here. It's a short paragraph, and this is true. I, I didn't bring the book with me. I should have. Uh, anybody have any old dictic teachers they remember from long ago? <laughs> Listen to this. Among Menachem's foremost opponents was Dunash ben Labrat. He wrote an extensive criticism of the Machberes, meaning of the dictionary that Menachem wrote, prefaced by a laudatory dedication to Chazdai. So you see the kind of guy he was. But on the other hand, let's get technical. He says, you translated this word wrong. You got the nakudos here wrong. You have the wrong binion or tense or something like that wrong. So in other words, among other things, in poetic form, he critiqued what Menachem wrote. And I'm not saying all the critiques are wrong. Hold on. Uh, Menachem himself was opposed to Dunash's introduction and the Hebrew poetry of Arabic verse forms and meters. Notice he didn't like his style of poetry because it was too gaish. Nevertheless, he did not reply to the criticisms. Menachem's students, including Yehud Ibn Chayuj, who is the George Washington of Diktuk. I know you've never heard of him, but believe you me, almost everything we follow today that we learned in school comes from Ibn Chayuj, who wrote his books on Diktuk in Arabic. All right? And he was a student of Menachem, and they defended their master by writing an entire treatise in which they eloquently refuted all of Dunash's arguments. So now you have a back and forth on the dictum. 
this controversy did not end there, because Dunash had a disciple, Yehudi ben Sheshes, and he wrote a whole treatise going the other way, attacking his, his students. 200 years later, 200 years later, two centuries later, Rabbeinu Tom got in the act, and he wrote a whole thing defending Menachem, you see, which was followed about 50 years after that by Yosef Kimchi, the father of Radak, who defended Dunash. So this was a back and forth business, like when I was young, they said, is Alger Hiss guilty or not, right? You know, back and forth, all right? And thus, the original controversy between the two was instrumental in producing an entire literature of philology in Spain and later in, later in France. Now, who studies this dictum thing? The most we have is the books we had in school. But where'd they get them from? You see? These are the guys they got them from, and uh, it came from an ugly incident. That's my point. Okay, now, uh, one last point about Chazdai ibn Shaprud, and that's what I would call Zionism. By, by that I mean thinking of the political prospects of the Jewish people a thousand years ago when nobody else did that. Okay? Herzl was in the 1800s, before him was nobody, except a little bit Chazdai. Because Chazdai was always being criticized and dissed by Muslim court officials in the caliph's court who really shoved it on him by saying, look at the political exile and utter helplessness of the Jews. At home, nowhere, living in foreign lands and always at the tender mercy of the Goyim. And what could a Jew reply in the 10th century? All he could do was pray for the Messiah. And then Chazdai found out about the Khazars, who were still around at that time, and this was a Jewish empire in southern Russia. Look at that. This is today Georgia, the Crimea, the stands, and all that kind of stuff. So believe it or not, once upon a time, it was a barbarian empire. And nobody knows exactly how and what and when and how many. But the king and all the big shots converted to Judaism at a certain point in the Middle Ages. At that time, um, all the barbarians were signing up either for the Orioles or the Yankees. Meaning, either you're going to be a Christian or you're going to be a Muslim. Okay? By the time the process is over, all the different barbarian groups either signed up Christian or Muslim. That's how the Russians, for example, became Christian, Eastern Christian. That's how the Turks became Muslim. You know, they weren't. Okay? So I don't know why, nobody knows why, one very powerful group who had this big empire said, I'm not in favor of the Orioles, and I'm not in favor of the Yankees. I'm going for the Red Sox. I'm going for Judaism. Even though it makes no sense, okay? But it did happen. Now, Chazdai, being an international statesman, heard from the Byzantines that beyond their empire is this Jewish operation over there. Uh, he went crazy over this. Uh, he said, you know, he didn't know about it. And he asked the diplomats in Byzantium and the other places, uh, you know, tell me about it and so on and so forth. And what he was mostly interested in is the 10 tribes. Right? That would be too good to be true. Correct? The Ten Lost Tribes are now a great empire in southern Russia. That would be too good to be true, because then he'll go there and he'll lead them you know, to reconquer Israel or something like that. Okay? Now, it's very famous that uh, you know, he got a letter back. He wrote a letter. They got a letter back. And they said, we're not from the Ten Tribes. We're Gerim. We converted. And there's a story about it. And... Uh, about 57, about 100 years later, actually, uh, more than that, really, Yud Levi wrote the Kuzri as a kind of fictionalized version of what happened. Uh, but the point is, and this is remarkable, there is evidence that Chazdei traveled there. Now, it's amazing. It's in the scholarly journals. He says, you know, if you really chase down all the old records, which... I can't believe, and would be really extraordinary that he would go from uh, Spain in the 10th century to what you and I today call Turkey, which at that time was Byzantium, and then up the Black Sea to the Jews and come back and not talk about it. But they have these records of him using boats and stuff like that. All I know is, being the great diplomat that he was that we talked about last time, he didn't lack, naturally, a hope or an interest is there a Jewish angle on this? Can we get a Jewish country 
and put this doggone gullus to end. You see? Now, nothing came of it. And indeed, during his lifetime, the Khazar Emperor was destroyed by the Russians. That's what happened. It was uh, totally crushed. But at least he had some kind of inchoate political vision, which nobody else had until Theodor Herzl, frankly. Okay? Where he thought, how can the Jews in different countries possibly somehow they get together. Now it's the 10th century, it's not the, it's the 900s, not the 1800s. So you didn't have the modern stuff in there. But it is something that's uh, fascinating. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is like this, he wasn't Satmar. He didn't say like this, oh, we're gonna wait till Mashiach comes or something like that. If it was possible, he would have pushed it. If it would have turned out to be the 10 tribes or something like that, you could be sure he'd fly there and he'd do whatever he possibly could to make it happen. And by the way, that's a novel. The Khazars now have a political master strategist, you know? What do they call these games, you know? When you talk about it, it'd be a game, you know? And they retake Eric's role in the 10th century. But it didn't happen. Okay, now we're done. And now we move on to our uh, second court Jew who, if anything, is more remarkable, as you shall see, than Chazdai, which is quite a, a record to match. And that is Shmuel Hanagid. Uh, as you can see over here, Hanagid simply means Shmuel, the, 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 the master, the boss. So it's like Shmuel Rabbeinu, something along those lines, a, a little stronger. But first, if you want to understand what we're talking about tonight, I have no choice but to do four or five minutes about the history of Muslim Spain because that's vital. We saw last time how one guy, and only one guy, in the hundreds of years that the Muslims were in Spain, got it together. Abdurman III, he just had what it took. Guys like that don't grow in trees. And he cobbled together by military force and political skill all the Islamic territories in Spain into one caliphate of Cordoba. As long as the state remained united, it could hold off the Christians in the north and enjoy tremendous economic prosperity. In its day, when Khazi was there, when Abdurman was there, I mean, this was the richest country by far. I think I told you last time, he had three times the budget, you know what I mean? He took in three times what he needed. Let's say he needed, I'm just making this up, let's say he needed a billion to run the country. His annual revenues from taxes and customs duties and so forth was three billion. See, he could put one billion in, Khazai writes this, to the Khazar king. He could use one billion to run the government. He could use one billion for what we call today the National Endowment for the Arts, which is what he did, and another billion <laughs> you put under the pillow, you know? This, this is how, that's how potentially economically rich a united and organized Spain could be. But Abdurman died in the year 962, and his son took over al-Hakam, for another decade or so, and he also relied very heavily on Khazdi and Shaprut, and it worked. So into the 970s, this guy died in 962, the next guy in 976, the, the, the kingdom worked. There was security and prosperity. You know, the Jewish history of that time in Spain is boring. That's good. Agreed? That's good. Right? Now, the trouble was, as always with these situations, the dynastic problem. When the Caliph al-Hakam died, he was 60 years old. He had many daughters, but only one son. And the son was Hisham. Uh, he commanded on his deathbed that his son, the young 10-year-old, 10-year-old, should succeed him even though he's a kid. This is the Middle East. The women don't get it, right? It's the son. Now, the father thought he's doing his son a favor. He's making him the next king. But of course, he was wrong. It's like King Yoash of Yehud in the Bible. You give somebody who's too young the power and authority, you're going to attract bad people to him like flies. Correct? Every sneaky person in the world will manipulate you, including his own mother, who had a boyfriend who twisted everything around his finger, Almansor. It's very famous. And they basically kept the kid officially as the caliph, but they kept him full time in the harem, away from public affairs for the rest of his life. And so he was mama, nothing but a figurehead. And the mother, 
and her boyfriend, Almansor, they ran the show. Now, I always say, especially with me, why do you need fiction? You understand? Why do you need... This is what Israel should have for the miniseries. You get it? I don't understand why they don't use Jewish history. It's so rich. So Almansor ran the show for about 20 years, something like that, a little more actually, uh, close to 25 years. And he himself was a, was a great general. That was his plus. He was the Hajib, the prime minister, but really he, he was the acting ruler. And the real caliph, like I said, was in the background. Uh, look at this. These are his military campaigns into the north. Uh, it's very famous in Islamic and, and Catholic history. Up there is Santiago de Compostela. That's like their Lady of Lords. Even today, millions of people go there as a Catholic shrine. And he captured it and burned the place down and brought back the, the bells. You know, it's like a triumphal. So, so the Hamon Am, the people in the Caliphate of Cordes are like this. Maybe he's a schnook, but listen, he gets the job done and he killing the Christians all the time. And believe me, if you know what happened those days, they would go north, kill all the men, bring back 10 million women, then everybody gets a harem and so forth. This is how life went in those days, okay? And so he ran the show over to Almansor. Now, um, but after he eventually died, and the caliph was still a figurehead, with no training in being a king or a ruler, you understand? He, he thought he was doing him a He did him a terrible thing. This is why, correct me if I'm wrong, this is why you have trust funds. <laughs> right? Would you leave a 13-year-old kid 10 million bucks? What's the next thing that will happen to him? Right? Every bad person will descend upon him, you see? So that's what happened over here. So when he died, his children, Almond or his children, plotted to get Hisham to abdicate, and they themselves would become caliph, even though they weren't from the right family. They seriously overplayed their hand, and the result was uprisings against them, prolonged and serious civil war, and the return to the pre al abderman conditions. And notice it was a stupid suicide of a state. The Muslims had a good thing going, right? I told you they were powerful, they were rich, they were even cultural, and they were good to the Jews, by the way, at that time. And they blew it over this stupidity, and they broke up. Um, into 23 different fighting states all fighting each other. They called the Taifa. Okay? So if you count them up, every little ruler, every little general became a king and plotted to take over all the others. Now you know and I know, they ain't going to do nothing. Who was the main beneficiary of what I just described? The Christians. Right? This was their big break. Because they played the Orioles against the Yankees and the Yankees against the White Sox and so forth and so forth. And over the course of time, right? And the Arabs were never able to get it together again. This is part of the culture. It's a very centrifugal culture. You know, it's, we see it today also in the Middle East. Uh, any country is held together with rare exceptions, maybe no exceptions. Every country held together is not by democracy, but by force. Okay? And a successful ruler in that world is someone who has enough force to impose law and order. That's all. So in Spain, you had it one time, and then they blew it. So Chazdai happened to be there, quote unquote, at the right time, at the right place. Right? But now it all fell apart. The city of Cordoba, which had been so beautiful, and is talked about even today, with the many universities, and libraries, and fountains, and palaces, the Medina del Zahara, which was like Versailles, and all kind of cultural artifacts, museums. It's not what you think. This is considered, by most historians, the peak of the Arab civilization. I mean, the Arabs say that. And then they destroyed it. Because when they started having these fights with one another, it turned into Beirut. It turned into Syria. The city was sacked repeatedly by one group over another. 50% of the population was killed in faction fighting. What about the Jews in Cordoba? Well, obviously it depended which faction you supported. You understand? You know, it depends which faction you supported. The Jews in Cordoba supported Mohammed ibn Isham, 
because he was a great grandson of Abderman, who had been the great ruler. But he didn't win. Another guy named Suleiman won and was angry at the Jews who were supporting the wrong team. So the Jews who were smart got out of Cordoba. The others were killed, if they knew it was good for them. And therefore, I'm describing in the year 1013 or so, the sudden collapse of a paradise. Right? If you want to know what it's like, and we'll talk about our hero in a second, imagine, we all know people like this. Someone who was rich in Germany before Hitler, or in Austria, or Romania, or in Hungary. And they'll say, oh, it was so good. And it was good for that family. And then the paradise just collapsed. You understand? And you can't bring it back. So this leads us to our hero tonight, because he was one of the refugees in Cordoba. His name was Shmuel Ibn Nagrela, Nagrela, right? Who was born in 993. So just figure this out. Abderman died in 962. His son died in 976. Almansor died in 1002. So this guy's born in the, when times were still good. Okay? He's born when times were still good. And he grows up. But in his teenage years, it comes apart. It's like Dr. Zhivago, you know what I mean? Now, the whole civil war of the Arabs broke out in 1009. So he was 16 years old. And things really fell apart in 1013, 1014, when he was 20, 21 years old. So imagine, you know, having this traumatic experience in your late teens, I suppose. So his upbringing and education took place in the last good years of the paradise. Is that clear? So as a result, he, and now, as we'll see in a minute, he was a genius, just naturally brilliant. And he was naturally very smart. A guy like this would, without question, you know, be the first in Harvard Law School, no question. And he therefore had the opportunity and the luxury, and when he was growing up, to attend and excel in both Lakewood and in Harvard, because both of them were located in the Cordoba. The great yeshiva that I talked about last week, that Chazdei started with the refugee rabbi, Moshe ben Chanoch, when he died, his son Chanoch ben Moshe took over. This is one of Gedoli Ador. So he learned by a serious, uh, uh, like I say, say like, like Brian Cutler, you know, to, to just give you an idea. But he also, because he was a court of a Jew, he also studied, I don't know exactly how, all the secular studies in the finest schools with the leading intellectuals in the Arab world because the Caliphate of Cordoba attracted these types. You understand? And so as a result, he had uh, Lakewood from Chanukh ben Moshe. He had Haskalah. He was a student of Ibn Chayyud, who I just told you was the George Washington of Diktuk. So he learned by the master. Limuri Chol, he had the best teachers in the secular sciences of the 10th century in terms of science. I'm talking about math and science. I'm not done. He also had the best liberal arts education, which meant at that time the Arabic literature and culture. So he will be a master of the Arabic culture and the Arabic language more than the Arabs, and they admit it. I'm not done. And also, he, t he is a master of Islamic studies because he wants to know what the other side says. And so he will know the Quran and the Hadith and all the rest are better than them, which is why we'll see later on Behind closed doors, he could debate with them. And uh, as we'll see, Ibn Hazm says, he said he was all wrong, but he was the smartest Jewish debater I ever met. Okay? So he understood the kind of education that's going to be necessary to succeed as a Jew in the Jewish world, but also in the non Jewish world. Okay? And you can't do it unless you have a good education. What's striking, as we shall see, is how did he excel? Most people I know who do well in Lakewood don't do so great in Harvard and the other way around. How do you find somebody who excels in, but that's rare, okay? It's rare. Loaded with knowledge, but no cash. He leaves Cordoba because of this uprising and the Civil War and the faction fighting, like the Beirut type situation, for Malaga, which is one of those little, there's the Malaga over there, right? So he says, uh, which was one of the 23 little kingdoms. Because he had to get out of there. It's not that far away. It's uh, less than 100 miles. At that time, 
the zip. The, if you see the map that says that they broke them to 25 different, 23 different kingdoms, it means local dudes, mercenary leaders, mafia bosses, stuff like that, Muslim, sometimes eunuchs, sometimes you know, janissary types, Christians who converted to Islam became soldiers. They just grab power wherever they can. Why not? So the Zirids is the name of a tough warrior group originally from Algeria. They'd taken over nearby, and they set up a capital in a small town called Granada, which started to grow as a capital city. The local Muslims, led by the Qadi, had asked a Zirid general named Zawi to stay and introduce law and order there. It's like that movie, you know, was it the, the Magnificent Seven? You understand that kind of thing? Well, yeah, he said, in other words, we're going to have some bad group in charge. You do it. But just in other words, if you take over, then there's somebody in charge, okay? And that's uh, this is what the, what the, this is how it started, and this is how it ended up. But it's, it's very small among the others. So that's called the Zirid Emirate of, of Granada. Technically, Taifa Granada. Taifa means the successor states. Now, this guy Zawi ruled for a while, but then he left. He went back to Tunisia because he wanted to take over there. And his nephew named Habus succeeded him and ruled for 20 years. So the two Arab kings, they're not even Arabs, they're Berbers. Two Gaisha kings, Habus and Badis. He's going to be from 1018, 10, 1037. 10, He's from 1037 to, I don't know, 1060 something. Uh, that's the ones we're no gay to. Both rulers were military types, and they spend their time on military matters. That's the type of person that's the Magnificent Seven. It's not Abdurman, <laughs> you know, art, class, literature, things. These guys are like, you know, always preparing for the next campaign. You know, spitting tobacco. You know, that kind of business, okay? And the Qadi became the prime minister in charge of civil administration because Habas was a rough and tough type. Meanwhile, our hero moved to Malaga, which was nearby, but it wasn't in the same kingdom. And a very famous story, because he was like one of these people that we all know came over this country after the war, and many of them started with a grocery store, isn't that right? With a small place. So that's exactly what he did, because he had no cash, and so he set up a spice shop in the bazaar in Malaga, right? Because he put two cents together and three cents to get borrowed from here and here and here. He had no money. And he started selling uh, spices. And uh, like I said, a typical refugee story. Obviously, he must have said, and we have poems about this. He said, this is what my old is. <laughs> I have a smicha from Lakewood, and I have a PhD from Harvard, and I'm running a grocery store in downtown Baltimore. That's, you know, that's what he said. But I say this sometimes. Uh, and then, of course, uh, he had his break. And the break was, it's a famous story. There are two versions of it. There, the Jewish one and the non-Jewish one. Doesn't matter. I'll give you the Jewish one, not that it's more true. He said there was a maid who worked in, uh, like a, uh, a cleaning lady, who worked in the palace of the prime minister, grand vizier. And uh, she had some issues with the IRS, but she couldn't read or write naturally. And she heard that this guy is selling the spices. Among other things, he can write letters. Do you, do you, I won't say you remember, because obviously we don't remember, but maybe you've read that long ago, like in the Middle Ages, one of the things people would do would, uh, would go and have people write letters for them, documents. You get it? You know, in the old country, right? Like in Galicia, so can you write German, you know, things like that. So she heard about this guy. She says, do me a favor and write me a letter for the IRS. And he wrote a letter, which was a letter, full of all the fancy Arab stuff, and the calligraphy was top of the line. So basically, it wasn't some little business. It was something that you know had been crafted by a highly educated person. When they got it at the IRS office, they said, who wrote this? You didn't write this. And she said, this guy. And they passed out the chain of command to the vizier, to the prime minister, who wrote this? And he got the guy over there. And after talking to him for five minutes, he's like, you're working for me. OK? You're working for me. And Next thing, and he, first he had him as a secretary, but you know how it goes. He started giving him advice, how to run this, that, and the other. And next thing you know, the Jewish guy's running the place. Meaning, the vizier is the, running the place, but he's getting all the ideas over here. This is how the story goes. And moreover, 
after a while, the vizier died. Uh, it was, a, it was a, 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 not a young man. And the king, Habus, said, like this, what am I going to do now? I don't even know if the king could read or write. And he was just a, a tough mercenary soldier. Uh, I don't know what I can do. And the vizier was on enough to say like this, to be perfectly honest, for the last two years, it's all this Jewish guy. You know, that's, that's the truth. And the king said, I guess, well, then in that case, you become. So he made him like the secretary of the treasury, you'd say, something like that, right? Uh, in other words, he gave him a job in the government, which was a no-no. In an Islamic state, you're not supposed to have an unbeliever, especially a Jew, have an official post. Khazdai, we saw last week, like I said before, was national security advisor, was not secretary of state. You understand what I'm saying? It was a completely unofficial job. And he knew how to dance on eggs and never offend Islamic sensibilities. But this guy, like I said before, was a Berber. And those guys converted to Islam not that long before. And they weren't so from. They used to have drinking parties, things like this, from Muslims not supposed to drink, and whatever. And he says, I don't give a darn. If the Jewish guy is good for the taxes, I'm going to put the Jew in there, and so forth. And so you had this situation. Now you can be sure the regular Muslims are like this. This is a sign of the times. When we had the caliphate, this would never happen. And that's true. But things have fallen apart. Everything's a hefker. And so even a Jew could, could rise to this position. Uh, the, uh, after the, uh, he remained in this position, Secretary of Treasury, charged at the taxes. It's unclear exactly. They had different titles. Until the king died in, in 1037. And then, as we shall see, he rose even higher. Now, the king, although a Muslim, didn't care for convention. He shockingly appointed a Jew, as I said before, with whole powers. All the regular Muslims were scandalized. But it's very interesting. He would not be macabre any lush and horror about the Jewish guy. He said, you're all lying. It's this interesting, because the Arab kingdoms all ran on lush and horror. Everybody's always informing on everybody else because of different plots and intrigues, which were usually true. You know, if they said somebody's trying to poison you or have an affair with the harem or this, it usually was true. And he simply said like this, I pick a guy, I stand behind him, and I don't care what you all say. It's just interesting, okay? There were cases earlier where Jews had rose to, uh, to, to political prominence, like in the Fatimid dynasty, but whenever a Jew rose to a certain position, he had to convert to Islam. Here's a rare case that didn't happen, okay? That makes him unique makes him a court Jew and not just a Mishuman. As we shall see, he served the state and the king very successfully, but at the same time, he cultivated his Judaism. Now, he's a very different person than Chazda ibn Shaprut, simply because Chazda did not have a good Jewish education. I'm not saying it's his fault or whatever. That's what it is. He had an excellent Arabic education. He had a medical education. He had an innate ability to be a diplomat. He knew how to learn, something like this. This guy has smicha from Lakewood, like I just said before. And so he opened the yeshiva on his own, because once he's secretary of treasury, he's got the money. He could not only support the Bukharim, there's no, no uh, tuition, he could actually acquire a large library. Tell me how common a library was, a large one, in an era before the printing press. But he had full-time guys working for him on the payroll, just so from in different cities. You understand? So now the yeshiva say like this. Next mom, we're learning suvas. He would say a year ahead, we're going to learn suvas. <laughs> Therefore, I want you guys to make 50 copies, 100 copies. You know, or 10 in this city, 10 in this city, and so forth. Okay? Uh, he also delivered the shiurim over there. Okay? So here's a guy who's the secretary of the treasury, let's say, and will soon be more than that. But on the other hand, he doesn't convert, and he doesn't deny his Judaism. Quite the opposite. Here's a famous poem, which is not politically correct today, in which he says, and he's a wonderful poet, as we'll see in a second, in which he says, I passed by a base medrash, and I thought they're murdering the Gemara. Right? Hayari Vazman, Barabi Rava, has time betrayed Rebbe and Rava? The Ben of Ben Talmud Riva is now now an argument between the Tanoim and the Gemar, because the way I hear this guy giving shear there is, you understand, he's all wrong. Blochein Sidro, al peep soim, mesei beten vader, seva chobar shiyomer, anihu mefi boshirav, 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 anihu
a great Talmud Chacham and get away with it? Is that where things are holding today? Uh, it's hard for me to see this. Yidmu kibi tzitzios b'zak migbas. Shiva is all you, like we say today. All you need is a Hamburg hat and a long coat, you know, and a long beard and the Mr. Rosh Hashiva already, you know? Is that what it takes? Because, now, by the way, he's talking about his own place. So obviously when he was away, somebody else was giving a clear and getting it all wrong. Zechor, ahaba lechtenu shenenu ali beis atzfili on On one hot day, you and I, my friend, were walking by the base medrash, v'shamanu chamor nor v'sabachas b'nei bakar agrov heba. And we heard animals going, mm, mm, wah, 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 wah. Now he's talking about learning. But he said they were acting like animals just because they're repeating things and what they're repeating is wrong. You understand? V'shamanu chamor nor v'sabachas b'sachti mi asher shosh peisalim kumo refes katsu. Who allowed animals inside a base medrash? You know, that's an avera. You understand? No, that's not animals. They're just repeating the clay. You know, uh, what's the, what am I talking about? The uh, road style repetition. Like that, you know? It's not like that. You've exchanged the Torah for something else. Ubonu zomi him. And then we came to the synagogue and meet him in the I wish I had made a wrong turn. They're all going like this, like a like a, win, a, a bush in the wind. Okay. And they're beating up the rabbis and the Gemara with their mouths. They're cursing Hillel, and with their hands, they're they're smacking Rabbi Akiva on the cheek. Now, of course, what does he mean? He means they get, they're misrepresenting what they say. Okay, so you're committing murder, he says, <laughs> right? Varav Yachlem Tamim Biyasim Moshonim Os Vateva, and the Rebbe, the Magid Shir, is making it worse by explaining, giving a whole Shir, explaining what's going on, and he's getting it all wrong. Viyoshavtman of Zomi Menasher Era, and I sat there all angry, and I was depressed, he says. Shalom Shalom Arav, the Kavod, I said Shalom Aleichem, and he answered me, Kish Modom Ve'evo. Like, what are you interfering in, in my class for? Oberich, ish isha. And then he started davening, And he said like this, Why do you say shalos isha? You're an isha, you're a dummy. This is the 10th century, the 11th century. This is Muslim Spain. And so the biggest insult you can give to somebody in the Arab culture, he said, what are you, a woman? You see? You say, you are an Isha. Now, my point is like this. This is an elitist stab at what he calls inferior scholarship. Do you think Chazdaib and Shabbat would know what's going on altogether in this? So here, the guy who's the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States is passing by near Israel, so to speak, and saying, what are you guys doing on alert? <laughs> so to speak. Okay? Now, uh, mind you, this person, Shmuel Hanagid, is one of the Rishonim. If you talk about the Sephardic heritage, he's in the chain. Look at this. Here's the Rambam, but let's go back. It starts with the guy on the boat, Moshe Mechanoch, who was one of the refugees that we talked about last time. He was succeeded by his son, as a God of the door. He succeeded by our hero. He succeeded by the Ritzkiyas, then the Rift, and the Rimigash, and the Rambam. So what you and I call the Sephardic heritage it has an important uh, part that they owe to this guy who was a secretary of the treasury, and I'm not finished yet, in a Muslim kingdom. He was also close with the famous Nisim Gaon of Kairouan, that's Rabbi, Rabbi Hanina, Rabbeinu Hananel and Nisim, uh, Rabbeinu Nisim Gaon. So in other words, he's tight with all the, as we would say today, the big gedolim. They became mechotonim. He becomes friends with Rabbi Haigon by correspondence. They write back and forth. Uh, first of all, Rabbi Haigon, the yeshiva's starving. He's loaded, he sent them money, I mean, you know. And in addition to his own yeshiva in Granada, he bankrolled Lucina, which turned out to be even more significant, because I can tell you right now, 
the Yeshiva in Granada gets destroyed later, the Yeshiva in Lucina lasts until the Rambam. And that's where the Rif was, the Rosh Hashiva, for example, and the Rimigash. So I'm just saying it's a major center of Sephardic and therefore Jewish Torah intellectuality. And he made it, okay? Uh, as I said before, he's very different than Chazda, who had no pretensions of learning. Here we're dealing tonight with a di very different type of court Jew. Like the Rothschilds, he was rich enough that he had permanently on the payroll probably 20, 30, 40 sofers. Some of them writing tefillin and say for term mezuzah. And what is he really spending most of the time? Writing Hebrew books. You get it? And he would give them for presents for people. And what a treasure that is in the 10th century when books are so rare. I mean, who can afford, I mean, physically, monetarily, who can afford to, to commission a shas, let alone 10 or 20? Both. He's a master of both. But he doesn't write what I talk about. He's hiring guys to write it. Now, by the way, here's where you have women. The main scribes for Hebrew books in the Middle Ages, regular books, female. Why? It's a side income in the house. Correct? In other words, how do you bring in money in the 10th century, 11th century, 12th century? You're a wife and a mother. What does it take to run a household, you know, a thousand years ago? You're not out, this is the Sephardic world, not the Ashkenaz, so you're not going out and running caravans and things like that. So how do you bring in money? So if you have a daughter and she's capable, when she, what are you going to teach her when she's a teenager? Calligraphy. Hebrew calligraphy. Agreed? Why? You write a night, you always need a sitter. True or not? You always need a sitter. Can't have too many siddur. You always need a machzer. Say nothing of a chumash and tanach, mishnayas, and so forth. If she's good, and why wouldn't she be? If she's good, anything you do, and you do it right, you can sell. So you could have five kids at home, but when it comes later in the day, if you have candles, something like this, Whatever you do, you're bringing in money. Why not? There's nothing wrong with that. Okay? Now, uh, in addition to learning, he was Mr. Dikduk because he was a student of Yudim Chayuj. And let me simply say, if you know anything about the early history of Dikduk, they're always fighting each other literarily. So the big battles over who's the smart guy and who's the dummy in Dikduk, Ibn Chayuj versus Ibn Janach. Now, I know they sound like Gaishan names, I get that, but it's Yehuda ibn Chayuj and Yonah ibn Janach. These are the fathers of the Hebrew that you and I use. They're the guys with the three letter of verbs and the Avar Hovel, see, with the, you know, the Chosre Pei Nun and the whole nine yards. Sefer Asheroshim and Sefer this and Sefer that. In Arabic, mind you, in Arabic. And he's a Talmud of Ibn Chayuj. And believe me, when the other team attacked his teacher, he wrote these whole treatises in, in Dikduk and so forth, defending his team, and he's a player. That's all I want to say. If you are one of those few weirdos, let's say in YU or something like that, that they pursue advanced degrees in Diktuk, you're going to have to read Shmuel Nugget. Now, if you're a regular guy, you're not. But you know, if, if you really want to know what you're talking about, one of the, you have to read more than that, but one of the things you have to read is Shmuel Nugget. How does he have time to do this while he's running the show? He found time. He found, I'm not finished. Poetry. Shmuel Anugid is one of the greatest, some would even say the greatest, of the poets of medieval Spain. Isn't that funny? Most people don't know this. He wrote thousands of quality poems. They're arranged later on by his kids in three collections. Ben Tehillim, Ben Mishle, and Ben Koelis. As you will understand, anything that's like a praise to God that's in the collection Ben Tehillim, anything that's a wise saying, Ben Mishle, Anything that's about, you know, life and the vagaries of life and the cynicism that's Ben Kohelis. Uh, his war poets, which he wrote a lot of, as we'll see in a minute, are in Ben Kohelis. And uh, it's kind of funny because um, he's not usually known. Those of us who have ever heard anything about medieval Jewish poetry, Yehuda Levi, Ibn Gaviro, 
who, by the way, was bankrolled by this guy. Shmuel Nugget, he paid, because Ibn Gavira, eventually, you know, Ibn Gavira was, had the artistic temperament. So anybody who supported him eventually cussed him out. You know, that's the artistic temperament. You, you understand? And he was wise enough to know that, and you know, he kept paying him, <laughs> right? But, uh, but you know you're going to get cursed. You know, that, it's that type. You know, like a Michelangelo type. But uh, uh, in the 19th century, they started to discover his poem seriously. And today, if you go, if you go to, like, say, Hebrew University or someplace like that, where they have real departments of poetry, they take it seriously, he's up there with the top. It's just funny to me and to many that, you know, he's not well known, better known in that regard. And the full edition of his stuff is from the 1990s from Professor Yardain. It's, it's, it's strange, but I can just tell you from the little that I know, he's a master of the poetic genre. Uh, it's interesting, as I say before, uh, it's a matter of luck. Now, wait a minute. What did I just say? Is Lakewood? Is Dick Duck? Is poetry? And by the way, he excels in learning, he excels in Dick Duck, and he excels in poetry, and I'm not finished. He wrote the first Ibn Ezra commentary on the Tanakh. In other words, Ibn Ezra says that he copied the style of Shmuel Nugget. It just has not survived. So in other words, he wrote a whole peerish. What do I mean in the style of the Ibn Ezra? Pashit Pshat. Linguistics. Very Spanish. Okay? Very Spanish, like a redact style. He seems to have composed even the first Shulchan Aruch. Isn't that amazing? Or the second. It's called Hilchas Gvirsa. Uh, here, he supported the interpretations and rulings of his rebbeim in Cordova Yeshiva over those of the Babylonian Gaonim, and basically, it's an antipode to the new and first of all the Shulchan Aras ever published, and that's the Bahag, the Alochis Gedolas, which many have heard of. So, the Bahag is a Gaon in Babylonia who crunches together in his way all the Halochas into the Shulchan Aruch, uh, not Kachim and Tyrus, but the regular Halochas, and he's writing a thing saying, no, 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 you're wrong, and this is how it should go. Now, the whole thing has not survived with only fragments. That's a lot of his bad luck. A lot of things did not survive with him. But how the heck does somebody go and write thousands of poems and a shulchan aruch and give a shir and do this and do the didactic and all the rest of it? I'm not done. Uh, and inter- by the way, so his work, the El Chazak Givirasa, is the forerunner of the Riff and the Rambam, Correct? In other words, this is brought to an apogee a little bit later in the 10 hundreds, first by the Riff and then by the Rambam, where they are defending the Spanish Mesora that they got from Moshe ben Chanoch and Chanoch ben Moshe against what you find in the Babylonian Gaonim things. Anybody who knows the Rambam in the Mishnah Torah at all will know, not rarely does Rambam say, the Gaonim in Bible said this and this, but this is what we do. You understand? And he wasn't coming from nowhere. He was relating his Misora. What is the Rambam's Misora? This is it. This is it. According to contemporary Muslim writers from the Goyim, he was one of the greatest astronomers. They, they say that, not me. Which means he had to do math and the other hard sciences. In fact, he has a poem about the two eclipses that he predicted, and I don't understand this. So I'm not going to put it up there. It's beyond me. He, he, you hear what I said? He predicted two eclipses. And he wrote about it in a poem. All of his stuff he wrote in poems. So he's a master of, of that. Uh, according to the Arabs, again, he was one of the greatest masters of the Arabic language and culture in his day. And he knew more about it than most Arabs. I'll repeat. I didn't say that. The Arabs say that. Okay? And finally, he was an expert on Islam. And so he could pick it apart if he ever let his guard down, which he did a few times in his youth with a fellow Cordovan, an Arab, who's named Ibn Hazm, one of the most famous of the uh, great medieval Islamic theologians, who cussed him out and wrote a whole book, but our hero was too smart to reply. Basically, what he did was he picked apart the Quran and said, look, it says this here, it says this here, it's a contradiction, this, you know, this doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense. But don't worry, Ibn Hazm wrote a book later in Arabic, it's very famous, 
where he picked apart the, the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, right? He says, this is what we call a holy book. Abraham says he married his sister. Yaakov married two sisters. Moses was the son of, a, of an aunt and, a, and an uncle and, and you know, and a, a nephew. And, you know, he, he, he found his things. Everybody can find something in the other guy's religion. This is how it goes, okay? But he did say that, you know, this Jewish son of a gun was the smartest critic that I dealt with. You understand? Notice, a lot of the other critics are fools. He was not a fool. He was just evil, <laughs> okay? Now that I've listed the Jewish and the secular intellectual achievements of Samuel, which are extraordinary enough, now we turn to his political career, which is even more extraordinary, okay? As I said, the rough king made him secretary of the treasury with wide responsibilities and powers. Shmuel excelled in organizing and running the administrative machinery. He did this in the face of fierce religious Muslim resentment. They did not like the fact that the Jews, you know, in, in charge, obviously. This constant resentment meant that Shmuel had to always excel. You understand? He cannot afford to ever mess up because his enemies will seize upon that. He couldn't screw up. The economy had to be good. The government had to be efficient. The courts had to be fair. The crime rate had to be low. And he did it. Okay? The secret to his success, because he, he died of old age. You know, they never were able to get him. He says, uh, the secret to his success was to emphasize the carrot more than the stick. Right? When people have money in their pockets, they don't complain so much. Except Jews. But I'm just saying, you know, they don't usually complain so much. Uh, he, there's a very famous story. Again, it's in the Sefer at Kabbalah. It's, very, it's the most famous, well-known story of Shemal and Nugget. And it basically says that he was traveling in the streets with King Habust. And some Arab said, damn Jew. And the king said, I guess, you insult my Jew? You mess with me? And he told Samuel, cut out his tongue. And then he went on his way. But he did not cut out his tongue. Instead, he got him a nice job with Social Security. That's exactly what he did. He got him a nice, with good pension and Social Security. And some of his cousins as well. And then a year or two later, the story goes, he passed by the king once again. And this guy said, long live the Jew. And the king said, I know this guy. I remember this from last year. I told you to cut out his tongue. And Samuel's like this, I cut out his bad tongue and replace it with a good tongue, <laughs> right? Now, you have to really understand the story. If this was just a liberal audience, you could simply say like this, see, it's a teachable moment. But believe you me, he was a child of his times. He would like to run that Arab through and chop him up into 10 pieces, but he was too smart to do that. Because you kill one guy, you made sworn enemies of all the family as a vendetta, you get it? On the other hand, you get the guy a job and all the rest of it, you know what they always say, it's not about money. But what does that mean? It's about money. So uh, that's just one example of how we was able to succeed. All right? Uh, in addition, he set up, he had to set up a very efficient FBI and a KGB, a CIA. When he was in charge, Every doorman, every chauffeur, every maid, every gardener is on his payroll. Thus, he was always ahead of his enemies. So whenever people plotted, somebody's listening, and they know there's 100 or 200 bucks in it, if, or whatever, if you tell them. And they always told him, and therefore he always stayed ahead of them. It's the smartest use of the money he ever did. During the 20 years of King Habus, 1018, 1037, the king himself ran the army, although Samuel assisted him in running foreign policy as best as he could. The fate of the state in this period was Machiavellian and Hobbesian. In other words, as I told you before, it was a war of everybody against everybody. And the plots don't end. They just go on and on. And today, like I said before, the Orioles and the Yankees team up to wipe out the White Sox. Tomorrow it's the other way around. Then, you know, the team from this place in Philadelphia and St. Louis got together to do this one. That's, it never stopped because that's how the Arabs were, okay? 
It never stopped. The Taifa state next door, as you can see over here, this is Granada, right? This is Almeria? Am I right? I can't see. This is Almeria, I believe. So the state next door was Almeria. The rulers there threatened Habus if he didn't ditch the Jew, he would, they would create a grand alliance and invade him. Okay? So as you can see, um, King Zuh Zuhair and his prime minister, Ibn Abbas, they hate Samuel, as you'll, you'll see this in a minute. Ibn Abbas is famous. He had the harem of 500 beauties. That's how he's known in, in Islamic history. Now, Habus didn't listen because he said, I'm not firing my Jew. But he soon died, and his son, Badis, took over. And he retained Samuel and actually made him prime minister. The king and the prime minister of Almeria then made good. They came to Granada, and they said, we're here to demand that you fire and kill this Jew. All right? Uh, Samuel writes poems about his anxiety and distress. Being these, he's like David Amalek in this regard. Whenever any important moment happens, he put into a poem. Some people are like that, and good ones too. He just was a master of poetry and of language. And so you can follow his career if you go through his thousands of poems. If you, it's, it's not easy to do it, but you can do it. And, he, and he's knowing, he's like this, I'm looking at the Malcham of us over here, Hashem help me, you know, the, I hope the king doesn't turn on me, and so on and so forth. But the king did not turn on him. Uh, Badis and the king, in other words, and Samuel, they, organized, they played Arab politics. After the army left and they said, if you don't get rid of them, we're going to come back with an invasion, Badis and Samuel organized a, a, an ambush in a narrow defile when the enemy army was marching through near the famous bridge of Al Fuente, and the ambush was successful, the Almerian army was destroyed, and Zuhair and Ibn Abbas were captured. Okay? And this is uh, recounted in one of the most famous poems in uh, medieval Judaism. It's very famous. 45, 50, I'm not, I can't do the whole thing. I, like I say, I hope to do it on, um, on, uh, in a podcast where I have more time. But uh, it's called Eloa O's. But I'll read the English. O oh, Lord of my freedom, God, beyond all praise, you alone, but all your deeds. The princeling, the swaggering despot, the plunder of the poor, that's who's against me. Okay? For your net is spread, and, and all who call your name call it the name of he who answers. And he goes on and on and on, and then he describes the battle. And he says that the enemy soldiers tried to win his soldiers over, but his soldiers stood firm, and they fired the arrows, and they took all these guys down, and they were claiming, ain't Shalom, ain't Heshkev, and Nefesh, Yehudi Zeb, itself Guf, and As long as the Jew's life is within his body, there's not going to be any peace. Okay? And on and on and on, it's, it's, it's too much. They got together a whole army, as he says, uh, He didn't rest until he gathered a huge army. In other words, Spaniards, Vandals, and Mohammedans. Okay? In other words, the whole mercenary army. And then came the attack, and... Here, uh, Hadovrin, we fired arrows at him like, the, like we were bees, and we cut him to pieces. Let's put it that way. And the enemy king and prime minister, who was his sworn enemy, were captured. And Shmuel is scared now. It's happened in the month of Elul, and he's scared that maybe his sworn enemy, the prime minister, will bribe his way out and then start his tricks all over again because maybe the king will accept a bribe to let him live. And uh, therefore, all during the month of Elul, and Aseris and Shuba, he's writing these poems, save me from this guy, okay? Uh, he's sweating bullets. Uh, and then he gets good news on Simcha's Torah. He's a guy comes to him on Simcha's Torah, and he says, guess what? The king went to the jail. He said, the heck with it, and stabbed him 17 times. <laughs> okay? And he said, this is Simchas Torah. You should read that poem. But, uh, I just have the one line, you know, go straight to hell. Benoah Abbas, Ibn Abbas. 
your, your body should be taken straight to Gehenna. In other words, it's Arab uh, 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 revenge. You get it? And he said, now, uh, it's called, it's, it, let me know the good news. Right? Because I'm going to tell you something. The guy would not rest ever if he remained alive. This is how politics was working. Okay? The following year, the Granada was attacked by Seville, another kingdom, in 1039. That's over here. And they will be the big enemy afterwards. I think this is it, right? So they're trying to take over this area. Each one of these princes held that he's going to be another Abderman and take over. Uh, Badis, the king, and Shmuel lead the soldiers to complete victory at the Battle of St. Gilles River. And therefore he's got another poem where he basically says, he daven mincha on the battlefield. I don't mean your mincha and my mincha. Hamilchama ben sivas anogi ben sivas asmael ibn abad. His lacha ben eim bekirbas beis nachal anjil. The battle took place along the river anjil. Oz Omar habotim leila. There's a long poem that follows. Then he said the following poem. Vesami b'makom tefilas mincha liyamahu. He ain't got no time in the middle. Arrows are whizzing by. Arabs are fighting back and forth. Him too. They got armor on. He's got no time to say, no, I'm wrong. He has time to sit down and compose on the battlefield in, be in between rounds a poem. That's like, who else did that? David Amel. Okay? If you know the Tehillim, he writes the war poems like that. V'shim Chadalik Shur. King David said, I jump over uh, a wall sounding your name. Right? So he... Well, what I'm trying to say is like this. This is not the regular court Jew, and this is not the regular rabbi, and this is not the regular Rishon. If a guy in yeshiva says, oh, I saw a svara brought in the neighbor Shemal and Nugget. He thinks he's some rabbi in their Israel or something like that, whatever. This is a very unusual person, okay? It's a very unusual person. He is the sole warrior poet in Jewish svarad and epic poems. I mean, these poems, the, the battle ones, go for pages. And they're good. They're very descriptive. I just can't keep it here all night. Uh, I'm hoping to do a, a series of podcasts if I can find somebody for that. By the way, a thousand couplets. He has these great two-liners. I mean, they're really good. Okay? These great two-liners on all aspects of life. Uh, you'll see one or two. I'll show you later. The following year, the, the cousin of but as Prince Yadir, aided by Seville, invades Granada again to seize the throne. The King Badis and Samuel defeat him in battle, but Yadir escapes and enlists the help of Seville and Carmona, which is another kingdom on the map. More, many battles ensue, but the Granada army emerges victorious. Then Granada is attacked from the east by Valencia and other Taifa states. Samuel leads an army to outflank them, and he does a Hannibal. He crosses like the Alps, over there, the high mountains in the Sierra, something or other, like Hannibal, and takes him from the rear. You see? Where did a guy from Lakewood pick this up? Now, by the way, he is leading mercenary armies. See, these are tough soldiers, armies of about 12, 15, 16,000 men. Usually that's the size over there. I mean, how does he do it? But he did it, okay? Um, crossing a high mountain range, surprising the enemy. That's why. There's a whole book of what? Shiri Milchama. He's got at least a hundred war poems, and they're not poems of fantasy. He was in the war. Okay? Um, obviously, a guy like this needed nerves of steel. He was wise enough to understand the Arab Berber politics, that they hate each other, but he also was wise enough to understand in the politics of that time, if you wait long enough, your enemies will kill each other or something will happen. You understand? Usually. Okay? If you long, your foes will kill each other in the normal course of doing business. There are many poems with this theme, such as this famous poem called Zimra, celebrating the imprisonment of the hostile Berber princes by the crafty Amir Seville al -Mutadid. In other words, al -Mutadid imprisoned his own allies, thereby alienating their principalities and driving them to the arms of Samuel and Badis, enabling Granada to defeat... Seville, can you follow that? <laughs> right? It's really cool. Let's go back to, to the map. Here. Here is Seville. 
The guy here was his sworn enemy, Al Mutadid, a famous person in, in Spanish history, in Muslim history. Uh, he was a real Arab, and he looks down at all the Berbers. And, but he got the, and he was plotting to overthrow these guys and kill Samuel. He has all these guys as his allies. Okay? It's a big threat to the kingdom. What's going to happen when they invade? Especially if they invade from several points at the same time. But then Samuel gets the news that the guy couldn't resist himself, and he brought all the princes here to his house at a party, and then threw him into prison. Okay, and eventually killed him in a bathhouse. That's how they do business over there. Well, what does Samuel write a poem? He says, this is great, why? Because then all the other Arabs will see he's not a guy they can trust, and they'll come and become my allies. And that's what happened. So you gotta follow the politics. You understand? You gotta follow the politics like that in the Middle East. This is not the regular court joke. That's my point. Here we're dealing with one of the most remarkable people in Jewish history without question. I think there's no question. Internally, Samuel had to prevent the Arabs and Berbers from fighting each other at home. And he had to always go because he's smart. He understands the Arabs. You've got to go to all the Arab parties and all the feasts, the Berber parties. Let me tell you something. Here's a guy who grew up in an atmosphere where a party was in Cordoba. Here's a poet, here's a mathematician, here's an astronomer, here's a religious scholar, a historian. The talk is up there. Now, what do you do when you go to one of these Berber parties in Granada? You know, my horse is prettier than yours. Something like that. You know, what's the price of camels? And this, I'm serious. It's a grub of Jungen, but you want to know something? He was too smart to show any condescension because he had to be. He was a master at dancing on eggs. And so he has to say, I guess, oh, the price of horses went up 10 cents. That's amazing. You get it? You know, slaves are down, you know, and, uh, <laughs> in the Algeria market. Okay, how about that, my man? You, you, you get it? He knows how to do it. Now, his son later on didn't, but he knew how to do it, okay? To spend hours and hours with the king who grew more and more Philistine and more indolent, leaving all affairs to Samuel, you know? Notice, you can't talk anything chasha with the king. So here's a guy with this huge education who would prefer an educated Arab. Agreed? And it, in fact, he prefer an educated Muslim. He could talk in learning, so to speak. But that's not what usually run out. Wars broke out again and again in the 1040s, usually instigated by Seville, usually, as I said before, <laughs> manipulating the small states as cat's paws against Samuel. And he's always got to counter that. And I can tell you now, I don't have the time, obviously. He beat him again and again. Notice he never lost a battle. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was 25 battles. So this is like Wellington, you know, he never lost a battle. Napoleon lost, he, he never lost a battle. Uh, again and again in the 1040s, uh, his calling card being the Hannibal maneuver of crossing the mountains and showing up least expected. You see, now that's just a smart, if you can pull it off. But it's not easy in the 10th century, 11th century, you know, to cross all those snowy mountains. He was ambushed several times. Once, he and his horse had to swim across the river to escape with the pursuing arrows all around him. He has a whole poem about it. Another time, he fell into enemy hands in the middle of the battle. But then his own mercenary soldiers rescued him in an Entebbe operation in the middle of the battle. Okay? In the poem, he says, because you rescued me this way, I'm going to finish my Shulchan Aruch. I'm going to finish the Hilchus like you also. That's the kind of guy he is. He has a, I, do, I was many years ago in the old Beit HaTfutzot. I understand it's been rebuilt and redone in Tel Aviv. Yeah. Right. I haven't been in the new one. But I remember the old one, and they had a whole scene over there of a poem from Samuel Nugget. I know the people walking by don't understand this. You know, I, I, I get it. And it's a poem to his son in which he said, we just had a major battle. And they attacked our left flank, but I was able to hit him with a right hook and this and that and the other. And now that the battle's over, now I have an answer to the Kashi you asked in Baba Kama. <laughs> Yehusa. We don't have people like this in Jewish history. 
Now, again, maybe Talmudically, King David was like, you know, that's how they portray him in the Gemara. But we don't have physical evidence as we do for Shmuel Hanagid, and this is not Ravon Cutler. <laughs> I guess okay, I can tell you that. Okay? Now, I don't understand, I'll say it again and again, why this is not the next miniseries. Right? Just tell the, you don't even have to invent anything. Just tell the story as it happens in 10 episodes, and it should, it should knock the others out of the park, I would think. Correct? And, and it's real. In other words, it really happened. There are plenty of sieges, marching and countermarching, endless pitched battles. It never stopped all through the 1040s and 50s of the 11th century until he died in 1056. And the wars went on after his death. Think about what it takes to recruit, equip, supply armies, and then lead them in battle. While you're writing poems and organizing shiurim, and by the way, as we'll see in a second, Paskening Shilas, because he was the chief rabbi in Granada, naturally. You understand? Uh, he even writes about himself, not bad for a Jewish boy from the Bronx. Look at this. He passes by a spot leading an army where the last time he was here, he was a penniless refugee running away from Cordoba. You see this? Look what it says. Do you remember Sandy Pass when last I crossed you? A frightened fugitive. The staff was all I had in my hand. Now I'm back at the head of 10,000 men who do my bidding like a son to his father. They await my words like rain, my plans like prophecy. Since God has blessed them with success through me, they willingly follow me as if I pulled by a rope. Okay? So like I said before, when I came, you know, like they used to say when I was young, I came to this country, I didn't have two pennies to put together in a, in a hand. Right? And now I own a department store. So he's saying, you know, I, I came here as a nothing, and now I'm commanding an army of 10,000 men. Right? Now, um, the, as, late as, 1060, as late as 1055, I'm sorry, but only, oh yeah. Having said all this, what is his take on war? Because he's seen war. This is very famous. War is first like a beautiful girl with all men long to consort with her, but in the end, it's a repulsive hag whose suitors all weep and ache. In other words, we all know they march off to war singing and parades and flowers in the guns the girls give them. 1914, for example, right? But then it turns out to be not a pretty girl. It's one of his couplets, right? So the point's like this. He has the right to talk about war. He see it. He's seen it. Okay? Uh, all the while, in between, like in winters, he's the chief rabbi of the kingdom of Granada, his Yah Basin, presiding when time and circumstance allow. He paskin shyly, he does the kitten, as we say today, the air of it, all the rest of it. But only when he was home, which is not often, too often he was out campaigning, which he complains about in, in one, writing from the tent, you know, with his army. Am I condemned to forever live in a tent like an Arab? Spend my life under its roof? Both the desolate terrain and time itself has caused me to forget what my home looks like. Right? I wonder, what are my neighbors doing right now? Look at this. Where are my neighbors? Where are the people, my friends from my chatzar? In other words, it's not fun to be away from home all, not, not if you're Jewish anyway, right? right. No, he, he wasn't a rough, tough mercenary type. He's actually educated for the opposite life. He was educated. But look what he could do. He was a virtuoso. Uh, and as late as 1055, the 62-year-old Samuel led another campaign. But then when he came back, he died physically worn out in 1056. So I guess he was 63. But he died in bed. His enemy still at bay. He had care carefully educated and trained his son Joseph, Yehusuf, Ye born in 1035, to assume his place. So his son is 20 years old. And look at this. Um, let's go to the next page. Did I give the English? Yeah. He, his son, he, he supervises his son education from the battlefield. 
And he said, I want to see your, remember penmanship? Right? No, no, no. In the Middle Ages, it counts a lot. I told you before, calligraphy. So he wants to see him write his Hebrew and Arabic letters. And what does he say? Every letter a gem like a stone in a crown. Every line straight as a stitch in a gown. Your columns are like trees full of fruit set in bloom, scented by you like a bridal perfume. Write and read all you can and study the Chumash, which he calls the law under the Kaparis. The more you learn, the more handsomely I will reward you. So he don't fool around. You get an A on the test, <laughs> you know, it's a hundred bucks. Uh, your lessons, look at this. Your lessons are inked on a scroll, but you are engraved on my soul. Okay? Yehoshua, I do love you, though often my chiding is all you see for my love is hiding. Notice, I'm a stern father, but it's out of love. Okay? Look at the Hebrew. Let's go back one. Very briefly. Ksivos kamahuderes, kabarekes misuderes, v'turel and the rose, miyusharim kamorikma bacheres, v'nechmonim leinayim kamapagim mevakeres, v'recham okarech mor, they're like myrrh, alikalam ukuteres, like a bridal perfume. Ksov ukra, keep up your writing and your reading, v'sim libach ladas arma kaparis, and place your heart for the Torah, meaning the Chumash, which we know the dust, the original tar was inside the aron covered by the kaporis. <laughs> right? It's got a rhyme, you know. Vim tosif, l'cha tosif, osif. If you increase your knowledge, I'll give you more money. Mechir harbe maskores. Yehosef, my son. Inksavtoma be barza begeris. You write with an iron pen. Muchtavat mechores al kvedi lobi yoseris. But you're written on my, on my heart, on my, my, literally on my uh, kishkes. Vuloch ava lakir libi, and I give to you love, lakir be from the from the walls of my heart. I'm a Russian mechaberes v'tel kachti magulach b'avosim misateres. My rebuke is open, my love is hidden. So notice, I have to be a father. I have to make sure that you do your work, your homework, as we say today. But I don't do it because I'm cruel. Right? This is a classy guy. <laughs> right? In other words, you see, the rhyme works. The meter works. And this is from a battlefield. Okay, from the army. The 21-year-old son skillfully guides the kingdom. His goal is to imitate a remarkable father. The economy flourishes. The coffers are full. The Jews are continue to ride high for 10 years. Joseph imitates his father in the endless politics and the endless military campaigns again. Under his leadership, Granada annexes Malaga. So they, they conquer and add this. Okay, Malaga. But it was impossible for a son born to wealth and a silver spoon in his mouth to have the father's saving grace of knowing when not to go too far. Agreed? As we say today, the father came up from the school of hard knocks and he made the money. The kid was born into the money. How many families do you know? How many businesses do you know? The kids ran it into the ground. See? Because they didn't weren't the father. And... Not only did Samuel know not to go too far in um, politics, but uh, it's hard to resist the life of luxury when you're born into this and women throw themselves at you right and left. Uh, and he builds a palace. And next thing you know, he's not so Shomer Mrs. anymore. And he can't help flaunting his superiority over the Goyim which is a supreme mistake vis-a-vis -vis the Muslims. The Jewish sources don't tell you this. The Arab sources tell you that he wasn't a Shomer Shabbos. You see, in, in other words, not really, okay? And they describe the fact that eventually he fell out with the king, and the king he felt was going to betray him, and so he started to betray the king by hooking up with Al-Maria, this whole thing somehow was discovered. If you look in the art scroll or in the Jewish sources, they'll say the Arabs got angry because he lived too high in the hog. That's a little uh, superficial. He was involved in the intrigues. And as you see over here, the intrigues were so constant and so susceptible of betrayal that it's very hard to do what the father did, which is to make it through your whole life without making a misstep. And the son made a misstep. And the Arabs all rioted and killed all the Jews in the community on the 9th of Teves. So it's very famous. 
Uh, this is what the Sefer Kabbalah writes uh, from the Raven in the in 1100s, that we all know that there are three events of Asar Batavis, the 8th, the 9th, the 10th. The 10th is the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem. The 8th is um, the translation of the Torah into Greek. The 9th, nobody knows exactly what. Shneir Lyman has Eric Lyman. They Some say Ezra died, this and that and the other. The Sefer Kabbalah said like this. This was obviously prophetic because it prophesied the massacre of the Jews of Granada. Now, this happened in 1066. And with this, I'm going to conclude. Uh, in English school, 1066 is the Battle of Hastings. Right? In Jewish history, 1066 is the massacre in, um, in, in, in Granada. The only thing left from the whole house of cards that he built was that yeshiva in Lucina. What? No, no, no. Dalhambra, I don't, I don't really believe that's true. Yeah. They say, you know, he, I, don't, I don't think that's actually true. When you go to the Alhambra, I was there, <clears throat> you know, they'll say there's a fountain with lions and Samuel has a poem about it and all that. Anything's possible, but I don't, th I, as best as I know, it came later. Uh, but um, let me say this. If you remember all the things I said, first of all, he let his writings, the son left no writings that survive anyway. The father has his writings, and the father had bankrolled this yeshiva in Alusina, which was an old Jewish town with a, with a fortress around it. Okay? When you drive through today, and we did this on my trip, you're in and out, you know, in one minute you're past it. But it was a big Jewish community once upon a time, and it could defend itself, and uh, that's where he like, built his lakewood, so to speak. And he appointed a guy who was a big Talmud Chacham, what they call Ritz Gias, Yitzhak Gibbon Gayat. And that went on for another 150 years. And what we call a glorious Torah heritage, as it were. And the, the uh, culture that I just described is the Rambam. He preserves it in his writings. When you read the Rambam, you're reading this culture, which was destroyed later by the Arabs, but survives in Maimonides. Okay? Now, the conclusion is that the father and the son were both court Jews. But the father knew you can never let down your guard. You're always on play, and you always have to plan. You don't do anything without thinking about it first. It's hard to do that. And especially when you're born rich and famous and all the rest of it, and, you know, you have... A, if you, want, you have, if you want, you have a life of wine, women, and song, and this is the Arab era. It's hard to control yourself, but you make one misstep, and it's all over. Good night.